Hello, hello, hello. Uh, today we have Alex with us. Yes, a lot of Alexes are there. So we, this is uh, Alex from Nansen. So Alex, welcome, welcome to Desi Crypto Show, B21 TV also we call it. So um, well, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you guys. Yeah, the market has been slightly sideways. I think it's just the effect of summer. Uh, we call it that ways. Um, and I think uh, the market should stay some you know, sideways for a few days. Uh, always bull runs and highs, highs, highs are not good. So I think it's a good time for the market to take a breather. What do you think about it? Yeah, I think um, people tend to think in binary terms. So like either it's a bull market or it's a bear market. But I think we've been in a crab market for a while now. <laughs> and uh, moving sideways, probably a bit longer as well. Um, but let's see. The long-term trend, I think it's good. And then in the short term, it's always very hard to say with crypto. Yes. So we are, uh, we are, a believe, we are believers of investing, not, uh, not trading. So, so we do think that uh, it's, the, it's a great market for investors. It's, uh, at this point of time, I say that you can have your value picks. You can find your uh small caps ultra small caps mid caps and then and then create your portfolio this is a time to be yeah. to be greedy <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean i think the interesting thing about like the crab market the sideways market is that it actually requires a bit more effort to find interesting opportunities right because it, in a bull market it's almost like you can you can throw money into any project and it's going to go like 10x over the next few months um, there are still opportunities out there that can go, you know, multiple times over whatever your investment point was, uh, but it takes a bit more effort to find them in this sideways market. So if anything, it just means you need to have better information and spend a bit more time researching. Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, I would say that, uh, um, we in the, in only in crypto world, do we talk in X systems? <laughs> Everywhere yeah. else you're talking about in percentage growth, and here you talk about X's. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And if your expectation is X's, I think uh, you're still early in the in the industry. So have a longer view. Don't think about short term, long term. Um, short term, uh, just stay. For that's what uh, it's. It's great to to see the market crab market. So yeah. Um, I was actually speaking to a friend of mine this, this morning. Um, somehow I managed to get him to co-invest with me in the Axie Infinity seed round. And it was like literally his first crypto investment. And I was telling him that we're actually up 250x on that investment. I mean, I, I don't want to brag, right? But uh, but th this was literally the first crypto investment he made. And he, he said, you know, anything that is above 2x, he would <laughs> think was a great investment, right? Of course. And he actually hit 250x on his first investment over the course of something like 14 months, which is pretty insane. Uh, but yeah, so we're, we, we're feeling blessed, you know, we're fortunate to be in this industry. Well, Adhiraj is a, is, uh, is a great proponent. We spoke to them yesterday. In oh, fact, really? we had a call with them yesterday. So we think that they are doing significantly well. I missed it, but hey, uh, <laughs> no qualms, okay? So uh, <laughs> we are in this industry for a longer haul. There yeah. are opportunities. There will be opportunities. There are many more seed rounds or seed type of rounds. There are, in fact, some tokens, I would say, which are, which are actually great potential. They are still at a lower valuation than their seed round. So it's a good time to pick. Yeah. Agree. I think actually the NFT sector is in the short term, one of the more promising sectors of crypto, and it seems to be slightly decoupled from the rest of the crypto markets. And uh, there's certainly a lot of organic activity in, you know, investing in NFT based projects, both on like trying to flip them, trying to be smart about how to acquire them in the short term and then perhaps sell them later but also in you know, the builder activity, a lot of the infrastructure around uh, NFTs, for example, in creating better liquidity through like NFTX or NFT20 uniquely and projects like that. 
So, so I think the whole NFT space is actually a pretty interesting sub sector of crypto to be watching uh, these days. I think that intra of NFT is interesting. I also think that NFT gives you a way to digitize uh, your assets. And I'm not talking about only digital assets, but you can digitize or make an asset registry of, of your property, of your, of your car, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, that, is, that is the future. So yes, totally bullish on that. We are very, very excited uh, on that space as well. Yeah. So Whatever. thanks for sharing some tips on that. So let's, let's, while we do it differently all the time, so let's do it. Uh, let's hear first about you. Take, uh, take your, who, who you are, what, how, how did you get into crypto? While well, we heard about the Axie story, but want to hear more mm -hmm. about uh, your personal stuff. And then we have some, some interesting conversations coming around. So want to yeah. know more, go ahead. Yeah, so my name is Alex Svanovic. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Nansen. Uh, Nansen is a blockchain analytics platform that perhaps we can talk a bit more about later. Uh, my personal background is from artificial intelligence. So I've spent a bit more than 10 years uh, in that area. Um, I spent about three years in man management consulting quite early in my career because I wanted to complement my sort of technical education with a more business management oriented experience. Um, and then I also spent four years in a media group as um, first data scientist and then data science manager uh, for a team across London, Barcelona uh, and Oslo. And 2017 is when I started getting into crypto. Uh, I'd obviously, you know, discussed Bitcoin you know, on and off for a few years, um, but it didn't really resonate with me. So Ethereum was the first uh, project that really got me excited about blockchain. And I kind of started to think about it more seriously in terms of an investment prospect and like a sector that might be important in the future. So it only took me a few months from I first bought uh, Ether to actually leaving my job and going full time into crypto. Um, and this was so basically end of, I would say like mid 2017, end of 2017, when the kind of ICO boom was going on, I started doing a lot of, you know, work around uh, crypto data. And I could see that there was a, there was basically a lot of interesting work you could do in the intersection of crypto and data. And I really liked how the crypto sector had an abundance of data. Uh, so you, as a, as a data scientist, it was kind of a dream. Um, and uh, you can actually do a lot of cool hobby projects because there are so many great data sources out there to do like analysis on and so on. Uh, but eventually I, I moved to uh, Hong Kong to, to start, um, basically start, I was the second employee in uh, an ICO funded startup there. Um, and I was leading the data team, uh, which I grew out from just myself to five people in total. Um, and that's when I met Evgeny, my co-founder at Nansen, one of, uh, one of my co-founders, Lars is the other one. And so Evgeny is basically, I would consider him the leading expert on blockchain data um, and you know, processing blockchain data from an engineering perspective uh, in, in the world, at, at least one of them. So he did this open source project called Ethereum ETL. And uh, I found him through that project. I was one of the first users of this open source project. And uh, you know, one thing led to another and I asked if he wanted to join my team at the startup in Hong Kong. And so he did that. So we started working together. He's, a, he's an amazing engineer. And so uh, we worked very well together. Um, and after this startup, which uh, had kind of a classic ICO style uh, fiasco uh, of, uh, of basically mismanagement of the treasury and all that stuff that many ICOs went through uh, during that period. We were basically laid off at the end of 2018, like the whole team uh, from one day to another. And so we did a bit of consulting for a while. And then eventually we ended up um, creating Nansen in 2019. And uh, yeah, it, it's, been a, it's been a ride since then. Happy to talk about like on-chain data and Nansen and all that stuff, of course.
Yeah, we 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 uh, first of all, congratulations on on the race. I think that uh, it shows uh, the the big players like uh, uh, like A16Z coming in. I, it actually shows that there is a lot of potential, and uh, and we we are early. We are still early, and yeah. uh, there's a lot more to do. So. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about nonsense in a bit, but we want to first congratulate and talk a little bit about the race. If you, um, I want to, I want to turn the conversation about. There are a lot of young entrepreneurs out there. There are a lot of young um, techies out there who have a great idea or who have a great product as well. If you will, um, how how should they think about doing something in the fundraise side? What should they do? Um, there are there are there has been you've seen the ICO round. In 2017, we have seen some great bull run and some good, good uh, raises in the last uh, last year or so. What what do you think that the, they should do to what has worked for you? Give mm. give some inputs there. Yeah, I think first of all, it probably has never been a better time in in history to raise as like a tech founder from anywhere in the world because. It used to be the case that you had to pretty much migrate to Silicon Valley and you know, knock on doors and do like PowerPoint presentations in lots of different VC offices and so on. Uh, but now everyone is much closer because we can do you know Zoom calls and and Google Meets calls uh, much more easily. So I think the the that's something to take advantage of, um, and it means that pretty much any notable investor is closer than you think. And often they're just one introduction away, right? So um, I think that's that's the first thing to to acknowledge that you know this is still early in that new paradigm where you can actually connect with with great investors. Um, so just kind of jumping on those opportunities that you can and trying to get the right introductions. Like you know you wouldn't email you know hello at a16c.com, right? You try to find some warm introduction probably. Um, and then the the primary thing I think is just to obviously you know it sounds easy but like build a product that that actually makes sense um, and try to get evidence of product market fit as early as possible. And so uh, we we were quite lucky because A16C was actually one of our first customers. They were using the platform because they are you know wow. they are they are smart guys, right? They they want to get as much information as possible. Um, and so uh, one of the guys in their team was like a, a kind of a fan of, of our uh, product. And so it was easy to have, you know, a chat based around that, like, you know, what are we thinking about the product going next, um, coming next and so on. And uh, we actually spoke with them from before our seed round. So we've done two fundraising rounds, a seed round in October last year, and then the Series A now recently. And... Um, in the end, they, they chose not to invest in the seed round, uh, right? But they were saying, you know, we really like the company, we really like the product, so we definitely want to keep in touch. And so we kept them kept them warm, right? Like we kept talking to them. Um, it turns out that, you know, they were super happy to give input on like the direction of the company. Um, and I have to say that Eddie, who's the guy I've been speaking with most at a 6 c has been extremely valuable in terms of like getting advice and, and thinking about the business. Um, but, you know, eventually we started getting close to the series A and we wanted to do that race in a very different way because in the seed round, it was more about drumming up the capital that we wanted and getting a pretty diverse base of investors in the series A, the thinking was let's find one strategic investor that can help us really, you know, take this company to the next level. And so I had a short list from the beginning of companies that I would love to have as an, as an investor. And A16Z was top of that list. Of course. <laughs> um, so, so I kind of, I kind of knew what I, what I wanted, which I think is always a, a good, a good thing to know. Um, and so that me that meant, you know, I was talking to them a lot. I ended up uh, pitching to Ben Horowitz himself, like I think it was wow. five five thirty a.m. Uh, in Singapore time. Uh, I, I wouldn't like ask to to change the time. I was of like, I would, I would take whatever I could get. Yeah, uh, and so and that was really cool actually because he is much more uh, plugged into the crypto space than I expected. You know, I thought, 
you know, he's thinking of crypto as a broad sector or something, but he's really plugged in. And I, I think he interacts with the crypto team at SXNC on a daily basis. Wow. So, so he, he was really plugged in and he, I didn't have to convince him like for a second about the future of crypto. He hundred percent believes in that. And that's why they have, you know, raised literally billions of dollars to invest in this sector. So, so that was really exciting. And then I also pitched to Chris Dixon, who ended up signing the deal with us. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's literally one of the top 10 VCs in the world, right? If you look at the, the, the Midas list and so on, uh, he's had some amazing investments. And so we're very honored to, to have him sign the deal. But, you know, to, to sum all of it up, I think uh, it's, it's kind of, there are some principles you can take away. Obviously, focus on building a, a good product and have evidence of product market fit as early as possible. So you can go to the investors and say, hey, people actually love our product. They're happy to pay to use it, which was important in our case as an information provider, because anyone can collect you know, a few thousand emails for something that's free. But if people are paying for it and you have hundreds or even thousands of users paying for it, that's much stronger evidence, right? So that's the first thing. And the second thing is to take advantage of the fact that these people are much closer now than they were before. You don't have to travel to Silicon Valley. You can often get introductions and speak to some of these great people um, in, a, in a much more easier way than, than uh, it was in the past. Um, and then I think the third thing is to think of it long-term. If they don't invest in like the seed round, you should, if you definitely want them on your cap table, you should put down the work to make sure that they might want to invest in a future round and address the points that are actually keeping them from investing in your seed round, for example. So with us, it was about demonstrating product market fit and demonstrating that we can actually grow fast. And you know, we the team did an amazing job from the first fundraising round to the Series A and making sure that we had a lot of growth. Um, and it was very clear that we could execute it well as a team. So I think maybe those are the three principles I would take away from this. No, I, I, there are many more things which you talked about which are <laughs> so relevant, you know. There is like, there is like a, um, it's like always a fear of starting. Can I approach him? Okay, what if, what if, okay? There's like this, this, this fear which is always in your mind. And one, even if someone says that, hey, we're not investing in seed, Series A, that doesn't mean, or Seed Round, that doesn't mean you can't, they can't come in Series A, right? They yeah, that's that's actually a big, big thing as well. And then, then talking about what you just talked about, saying that your uh, that the top management itself is so much plugged in into mm-hmm. crypto, right? Ben himself is so much uh, plugged in in crypto. That is a huge uh, morale booster that we are in. We are in the right space. It actually should give our viewers, our listeners, the um, that that this, you are still early, right? <laughs> so yeah. you can create a lot of uh, lot of value here. You can create a lot of wealth here. So you can make a difference as well. So absolutely. That's very true. I mean, it's, it's worth remembering that um, Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz were really pioneers in the, um, in the in early days of the internet and also in, in cloud, right? So if these guys like believe in crypto, that's a really good sign because they have seen what was the, the previous revolution, which was the internet, right? And they believe this is the next big thing. So that's that's yeah. really a positive sign. I think that I, I, I'm just going to, uh, I, I, as much as I'm I, just for, for uh, with the fear of being wrong, um, as much as I know that they were the early investors of PayPal as well, which actually led to the, uh, to the digitization of uh, of money, right? So mm. and all the all the uh, all the wallets, etc., which get formed. So they are. It's. I think that's how I would look at it. They they have been doing significant uh, stuff in the in the industry. Uh, yep. So yeah, always. Um, so that that's what that was really really good good insights into this. Um, Talking about a little bit more about this, did, when you talk about cap table, um, mm. do you do you see when you do Series A, etc. How should and there are there, I'm sure that there are many who are doing uh, and who are in the process or who would do in the future. 
how do you structure it is it mostly equity you gave or in the crypto world you look at the token you gave or is it mix of both what mm. what is the approach you would suggest and what did you do yeah so this is uh something that's changed dramatically since the last bull cycle so in 2017 18 tokens were primarily something that retail investors were interested in and most institutional investors would not touch it uh in this cycle it's almost the opposite uh everyone wants tokens including the institutional investors and i frankly you know we did an equity round if we had done a token round i think we probably could have uh, been a lot more aggressive on the valuation and so on because the the demand for something like that is just it was it's been just enormous um the way we did it is actually pretty different from from most uh, companies and projects so um we did not and have not tokenized our business we're a more traditional uh company so we have a software as a service business model which means that we sell subscriptions you can pay for those subscriptions in crypto if you want and many people do that um but it's a pretty straightforward business model where you basically pay to get access to the product um the main reason we've done it that way is that we want to focus 100 on the product uh the risk if you introduce a token, now there are different ways to do this, but the risk is that you have to innovate in two dimensions at once. You have to, first of all, create a really good product, which is you know, hard enough uh, in itself. But then secondly, you have to innovate on the token utility model or the tokenomics of it. And we just have said it, I think we should put all our resources towards building a really great product and let's just fix the sort of business model component is something that we know works. Um, and then that doesn't mean that we won't tokenize in the future. We might, but I'm not rushing for that. Uh, so I still want us to focus 100% on the product. And um, I've seen many examples in the crypto space where there is a token and the token kind of gets in the way of the product development, which is a shame. So it, you end up kind of almost with a form of debt to the community which is not great where like the community is expecting you to create some kind of value for the token that they invested in and what you want to do as a founder is just to create a really good product but you can't really find a way to fit the token into the product and then that creates a lot of resentment and negativity in your community so that's that was a trap i didn't want to fall into um so Having said that, like I'm obviously very bullish on tokens when it makes sense. Like our whole company is basically based on, you know, providing analytics for tokens and many other blockchain-based applications. So um, I think if you do have a very clear product, you kind of know already how it should work and how a token might fit into it, it could be a good idea to add a token to it. And there's no doubt that I would say, like, if you can tokenize in a meaningful way, you should because it, it is there's so much there are so many benefits from it like the liquidity is just better you know there's generally more demand for you You can tap into a much broader investment base you automatically get a secondary market where people can trade it and so on so if you can tokenize in a meaningful way i would do it but i would also say you know that's a big condition you need to make sure that there is an actual meaningful way to do the token i'm personally not a huge fan of this kind of generic Let's just create a governance token and see how it goes. You know, at, at, at least you should have an idea of what the governance token like might be used for in the future, besides just deciding things. So yeah, those are some uh, high level thoughts. I think uh, so. I think there are many more many things which you talked about, which which you don't even know that you have provided so much value in this conversation. One thing which which as a listener I, and I want to highlight whatever you talked about i just want to highlight one point that you if you raise equity it doesn't mean that there will not be a token yes, there sir. is a possibility it yeah. is it doesn't it doesn't have to be either or okay if you don't see a value in token today don't do a token today you can always do a token later yeah right and and i think that it's more important to uh uh, to stay focused, it can be a token, and I I do think 
I, I'm a personally a believer of token, primarily because it is distribution of wealth. That token is the only way with which small investors can get in, right? Yeah. Um, A16Z, um, I, A16Z could get in, I could not get in, right? But we mm-hmm. talked about in the early earlier conversation of this whole segment, okay, of that um, Axie, right? You yeah. could have gotten into Axie, right? That's right. Yeah. So it's it's not easy. Um, but a retail investor is the only one who could have, who retail investor could have, can have, yeah, today has the opportunity to get in something like an Axie, right? Yeah. And we talked about that um, a little earlier in the conversation. So uh, I think it was not recorded, but point where we are is that that both the things are possible and it actually democratizes the fundraise, it democratizes the distribution of wealth. So there's so much more you can do. So yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I think I think that's a great point. And I want to be clear that um Personally, I don't think that the current IPO path is the way the world should work, where effectively Coinbase, you know, does an IPO or or direct listing depends on the company uh, at a valuation of say hundred billion dollars, because that's like the only time the retail investor can come in and actually get an ownership of that business. That doesn't seem right to me. At the same time, I'm also hesitant on you know issuing it token if it's very unclear how the token will have utility too early Uh, because as i said before it can distract you from building a really great great product so i think there's something in between those two extremes right and i think there's going to be a lot of interesting uh, experiences uh, that will hopefully you know be aggregated over the next few years where hopefully companies like nonsen can somehow go public or exit to community before we are worth hundred billion dollars, which hopefully one day we will be. Um, but we don't want to wait for that IPO until like someone who's like a user of Nansen or just a you know Nansen community member can can access that opportunity. So this is this is one area where I think I think startups actually have to work a bit with with regulators to also find a way that you know it, it's easier to make to make it possible for normal investors to access these companies and, and own shares uh, or some kind of um, assets that correlate with the success of the company uh, i hope that we can you know pave the way a bit in some way or form uh, that's one of my expectations i don't really think we will take the path of trying to ipo at 100 billion dollars um, that's not re- really what we want you know we want something where the broader community can take part in the success of Nansen. Um, but yeah, we, we do want to do it in a meaningful way. Like we don't want to just slap some ra- like arbitrary token onto our business and then potentially cannibalize our revenues and, you know, cause a lot of resentment because the token has no correlation with our business and so on and so forth. Yeah, no, this is, this is great. So let's talk a little bit more on Nansen. Okay. Um, how, how can, uh, a crypto trader or a crypto investor can use it and uh, uh, who are you, if you can share who are your valued customers what are they using for if, if you as a person individually also use it give us a little bit insight there yeah so Namsen is a blockchain analytics platform uh, and what's unique about it is that we not only ingest on-chain data so basically every transaction that takes place on a blockchain like ethereum but we also enrich that data with additional labels. And so labels could be entities like this wallet belongs to Binance or this wallet um, is a Uniswap pool or it belongs to a market maker like SCP or Alameda or Wintermute. Uh, And so that gives you a much richer overview of blockchain activity than if you just had the sort of vanilla on-chain data. And what do people use it for? So it's primarily investors and traders that use Nansen, and they use it for what I would uh, describe as three different areas. The first one is to discover opportunities. So there are dashboards that you can use Nansen where you can see, hey, there's a lot of capital flowing into the smart contract in the last hour. Maybe that's like a yield farm I should be looking into or, or something like that. So this is the discovery part. And then you have the due diligence part. Once you have seen this opportunity, you want to understand it better. So you can plug in 
say a smart contract in one, our, in one of our dashboards and you can see who are the addresses that actually put the capital in here? You know, are they smart money uh, addresses or are they sort of random arbitrary addresses that we don't know much about? That can inform your decision of whether or not you should also partake in that opportunity. You can also plug in, you know, different tokens and you can see the top holders of the token, who's accumulating it and so on and so forth. So that's the due diligence part. And then the third part is defense. So these are the three Ds of Nansen, right? Discovery, due diligence, and defense. And defense has to do with making sure that your portfolio is protected from certain events. So if a lot of money is suddenly moving out of the smart contract, or if someone is suddenly sending a bunch of tokens to an exchange, you can get real-time notifications to like Telegram, Discord, or Slack so that you're aware of it and you can protect your portfolio and make any adjustments that you need. Uh, so, so effectively it's like a, an investment companion. And um, I like to talk about this from the perspective of the purpose of Nansen. Like why does Nansen exist? Why uh, do we get up in the morning to build this company? And really it's because we want that, we want to see the future of finance become a reality. So we want to see a future where we have an economy that is powered by blockchains and is more decentralized. But in order for that to happen, the pioneers, the people that are in the space, like you, you have to become a winner, right? You have to succeed in your investments and in your usage of DeFi, NFTs, etc. And so what we help you with is to surface the signal in all of this activity so that you can focus on the stuff that matters, on the opportunities that you might want to look more closely at, and ultimately, you can uh, come out of the crypto space as a winner, right? And if you do that, you will reinvest into the crypto space, which grows it, right? And you will be a role model to other people who have not yet joined, and then they will join the crypto space. And in this way, by making the pioneers winners, we're growing the overall crypto economy by having more reinvestment and having other people also join the space. And hopefully, the decentralized finance space as a whole becomes a reality in the future. So that's that's what we want to accomplish as a company, you know, besides just doing, you know, analytics and showing people, you know, all this interesting data. Yeah, no, this is extremely exciting. So, so uh, how, do, uh, how, how do we know that which, or how do you know which wallet, wallet belongs to whom? Yeah, that's the big question everyone asks, right? Yes. Uh, and so, and so, um, there is no silver bullet here. There is no one algorithm or master solution. It's actually just a lot of hard work by a lot of people. Uh, and I can talk about it in terms of principles and areas that we use. So uh, it's a combination of man and machine. So you have human intelligence where in some cases people will, in our team will literally read press releases of investment rounds in certain like token rounds. And then we can make inferences from that press release on what the different wallets are, right? So if you see a lead investor in a token round, we know the address of the token round, then, well, we can look at the distribution and say, this is definitely, you know, Venture Fund X's wallet because they led that round, you know, et cetera. So that's, that's like one way, but that doesn't scale very well. So you can't really do that for like, you know, thousands of projects, right? And so the other uh, key thing we do is that we develop algorithms and heuristics that tag up addresses. So in the case of exchanges, we have addresses, uh, sorry, we have heuristics that we have built for the different exchanges because we have studied how they, the exchanges manage their wallets. And so then we can tag up something like finance deposit addresses uh, based on the transactional patterns that we observe on the blockchain. Um, the cool thing, of course, is that you know, these are just two methods, right? There's a lot of other methods. The cool thing is that these methods also feed off of each other. So you get this compounding effect where if you have three different addresses, um, A, B, and C, that interact with each other, and you know what A and B is, sometimes you can make an inference to say, yet yeah, now you know what C is as well. Um, but that only works if your quality, the quality of your data is really, really high. If it's not high, you can end up with negative compounding effects, 
right? So the quality of the data is extremely important. The precision has to be 99.9% .9 plus. So that's something we take very serious. And um, th this is something that I, is kind of um, one of my pet peeves of the, the crypto industry. It's great that there's a lot of data available, but there's not a lot of quality assessment on that data, which is kind of worrying because, you know, whatever gets the most retweets, you know, people accept it as, as the truth. But in reality, I think we, well, one of the things we want to do as a company is to raise the bar when it comes to the quality of the data and make sure that we have really, really high quality analytics that we provide. Yeah, this is great. Now I'm going to create, I'm going to, I'm going to go into a, uh, two different points here. Okay. Um, because we, we always believe in um, looking at further. So, so two things which arise from here, uh, which has not happened. Do you see that industry going into on-chain KYC? Hmm. Um, definitely there are, there's evidence that this is happening to some extent. So um, I guess there are a few anecdotal examples. Um, you have the Aave Pro pool, for example, which is kind of a restricted pool where effectively you know the sources of the capital going in and it doesn't really mix with you know, the rest of the DGENs in the crypto space. Um, so that's one anecdotal example. You have platforms like TrueFi, which is like under collateralized um, lending. And it really only works because you know the identity of the borrowers. And yeah. so typically big um, players like Wintermute or Alameda can onboard there. And that means you have um, identities linked to addresses through their platform. So there's certainly evidence that you know, this will be a part of DeFi. Um, if the question is kind of, will this be the only way that, that we use DeFi? I, I personally don't think so. Um, I think it, it could be a, a great sector and it could be the part that will first connect with FinTech companies, for example. Um, but I don't see it being, you know, fully KYC'd. Uh, it, it's just, yeah, it, it doesn't seem very likely in my opinion, that that's how the world will evolve. Um, because obviously like these things are permissionless, right? So there will kind of always, I think, exist people that are using DeFi, even if, even if many regulators are trying to enforce this, it's hard to create like fully global regulations around it. Um, and so it might be a big, big part of DeFi, uh, but I, I, I don't think it's gonna be uh, the only way that people use DeFi. Well, what if that happens, right? Would it not be, would, would DeFi not come into mainstream? If you have full KYC on and everything that happens in, in DeFi? I mean, maybe, but uh, how comfortable are people, you know, with KYCing on everything they do on a blockchain? I'm not 100% sure that you so, might just lose out a lot of the users, to be honest, but uh, you might gain a, a lot as well. So I don't, I don't have, I don't, I wouldn't say I have any strong sort of feelings or opinions about it, uh, other than, you know, if it grows the DeFi pie, then I think it's a positive thing. I think my, and I'm, 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 this is, this is the segment in which we are, we are just creating a possibility. We're creating the future, right? So yeah. I think there is, and what I what I like about is in this conversations, it's not that while most of the times when we go in a conversation, it's like all of us are believing the same thing. We believe in the future mm. of crypto and we're like vehemently yeah. agreeing on things. Uh, mm. Here I'm saying that we have to do a little bit uh, differently. So we are trying to, uh, because when we, when we debate, then new possibilities arise. So yeah. I think my view is that if we are able to do um, KYC on chain, there is significant amount of acceptance which will come on on um, on the DeFi world. I think that's one thing which is missing. Once you are able to do KYC on chain, the other thing which also will happen is that the data will be in the hands of the of the individual. So if I have done the KYC on chain and I have my verified wallets, I don't need to share all my KYC details with everyone. I can share yeah. it. Because because I control the KYC keys, right? Or I control the on chain um, the the private keys, and you can have multiple levels of private keys in which you can share whatever level of data. So then it it actually brings in even more use cases in the world. 
Yeah, I think um, so. There, there are a few different things to discuss there. So, first of all, uh, one question is: uh, Will it be specifically on-chain KYC, or could you imagine that you have just KYC service providers that off-chain keep records of which addresses belong to which entities, and that's good enough for for that's something, right? Too. That 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 could be one outcome, and then in that case, it would be a little bit more privacy preserving. Because yes. you could you could sort of say you know you could go to this uh, centralized entity and verify that this wallet belongs to me or or something like that, but you don't publish it to the broader okay. network, okay. right? So and then there are then there are other approaches where you might want to do this on chain, like fully transparently, so anyone can check what the identity of this address is, almost like ENS but on steroids. Exactly. Right, exactly. like with some kind of verification and actually linking it to oh, your identity. I, I, I will in fact even say that it's like a Twitter address which is verified, and you have like blue tick. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually I think that analogy is very good because yeah. I also believe that um, yeah, I've started thinking more about crypto as like social closer to social media exactly than, exactly. than it is close to finance. Exactly, and and maybe it's like a similar mindset shift where. You know, when social media started, I think a lot of people would find it very privacy invasive to be publishing okay. a lot of their like, you know, personal photos, opinions, political views and whatnot on the public web so that it can be, be viewed by everyone. But now that's totally accepted and totally normal. So maybe there's a kind of similar thing where we, we shift people's mindsets where, you know, in the past, no one was comfortable knowing like how much wealth you have or like what you invest in and so on. But perhaps in the future, people don't really mind. It's just part of your identity and it's part of the kind of information that you broadcast to the world. So it, it will be a totally different uh, view on privacy. And if you think about it, the generation that has been growing up with the internet and with social media, I think they have a wildly different perspective on privacy compared to people who grew up without social media. And so maybe they're much more susceptible to something like on-chain KYC or just having their finances exposed to the world. Maybe they don't mind. So, you know, another point I would, I would, um, another um, sort of analogy I would point to here. Uh, so I'm, I'm originally Norwegian yeah. and in Norway, anyone can check the income taxes of any other person and also the wow. wealth taxes. And this is kind of like a radical idea for many people. And they feel it's, you know, privacy invasive, but the thinking has always been that you should be able to check, you know, if your neighbor is co contributing the taxes that they should be, you know, given that what you know, and it's, it's not like Gestapo or trying to like rat someone out. It's just, why not? You're contributing to the, the common, uh, the, the common goods, the public goods of society. And why shouldn't everyone know about that? The funny thing is that you know, you, by the same token, you could say, hey, if I'm showing you how much um, how much taxes I'm paying, I want to know if you looked at that that information. So now you can also get a record of who has actually viewed your information. So the transparency go, goes exactly. both ways. Exactly. And so that's kind of interesting. Like maybe you should have the same thing here where like if you could. Only the verified like, addresses should be able to see if you are verified or not. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. that's kind of that's actually the approach they've taken, right? So, hey, you can access like the real time information on this uh, address or this entity and what addresses they have, but they will be informed that you with your exactly. identity. So you have to opt into it. So that you know that that could be an interesting thing to explore. I haven't thought it through and how it will work in a crypto context, but I think it's kind of an interesting uh, way to solve that problem. Hey, someday. Where we might be working on that project together. So I'm pretty uh, excited on on chain KYC as well. These are some of the things which I think uh, the industry needs and will come. There are very smart projects which which are working on this, and then someday, uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be lovely. If you hear anything about that, keep us in mind. We are extremely uh, passionate about that space, and if we hear something, we will we will certainly reach out and see if you want to uh, contribute or join in. So. Yeah, that's, happy to discuss that. Absolutely, I, I want to. I want to. Uh, one more point. I want to. It, it comes to me. You know what? I, I and and I want to say this out loud in a in a very nice way, 
that while you are all about token investing, your business is around token investing, isn't mm-hmm. it, right? Who has invested where in tokens? It's all about investing in tokens, but you don't have a token yet. That's right. All right. And I think it is all acceptable. That is all acceptable in this industry, right? That your you actually or nonsense actually tries to check around uh, who has invested in what and like triple D's you talked about. It's a beautiful analogy. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful um, thing to see that while that is all there, you still don't have a token and your 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 investment or you've taken investment in, in equity, which is which is great, right? You know, this is where the the uh, the both worlds meet. Yeah. So so we're really excited to see. So I just wanted to point that out if it was not obvious enough. So yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that's, that's very true. Um, as I said before, I don't think, uh, I think you could, you could see an awesome token uh, in the future, but it has to be thought through. Um, and, you know, as I said before, like if you can token or if it, if you can tokenize in a meaningful way, you probably should. Um, that's not like a legal advice or anything like that. Obviously I'm not a lawyer, um, but I totally buy the point about Nonsense having a token if it makes sense, but it needs to make sense. And that's where I'm happy to, for now at least, continue focusing on the product exclusively. And then perhaps there will be a way to exit to community. And probably the way to do that is through some kind of token. Yeah. Let's let's talk, uh, uh, now, now let's change topics. What are you most excited about in the crypto industry in future? What What is that you are, very much looking forward. You are an analytics person. You are, have an analytics product. You see numbers and data and the money moving all around. What are you, what trends you see? Give us some bites. Yeah, so a few different things. The first one is probably DeFi. And I mean DeFi at scale. So the idea that and I think the way we get scale, and by scale, I mean, you know, hundreds of millions of people, eventually billions, hopefully, uh, using, using DeFi. Um, I think that DeFi is really a back-end technology. And I think the way you get true scale is not by trying to build the new front ends, but rather hooking into FinTech uh, applications. And so... I'm pretty excited about the idea of fintech switching teams from building on the legacy traditional finance infrastructure to DeFi, and I really think that's the that's the most strategic thing that we can do um, as as DeFi proponents. Um, it does not mean that everyone has to use DeFi through, you know, say Revolut or Venmo or Robinhood, but frankly, most people are not going to use MetaMask. Um, so you yes. need you need easier interfaces, and so the getting DeFi to the masses, I think, is probably the most one of the most exciting prospects of the whole crypto industry because DeFi, you know, has the best product market fit of any uh, any applications that we have built uh, on blockchains. They're just extremely useful. They're just ten x better than and or more than traditional legacy uh, finance products and and applications. So I think that's the most uh, interesting one and the most promising one that can actually change lives and make the world uh, truly a better place. The second one is is around virtual reality and and the metaverse perhaps more, more broadly. So I think it's pretty obvious that we're moving into uh, a more digital world. I don't think anyone agrees uh, disagrees with that. Um, and I don't think that credit cards um, are the way we're gonna we're gonna pay for stuff like in the metaverse in like virtual reality and these virtual worlds and uh, also in in games. And so I think the natural fit here is crypto. Like crypto and blockchains are just a uniquely good fit with virtual worlds and uh, the metaverse. And I think the cool thing about this is like, this is an expansive um, market for crypto. It's a, it's a really a market that 
is very small or doesn't even exist today. And so if you think about the total addressable market for crypto, um, this is expansive. Like you, you can't really even count how big it is because it's practically zero today. So anything that has to do with you know, gaming and virtual worlds. I mean, you, you could look at the gaming economy uh, and that's re a really big economy today, actually. But when you think of that as being more immersive and a place where you spend much more time, um, I think that's a huge market and a huge opportunity for crypto. And, you know, that's not just payments, right? That's also digital assets, like virtual items, virtual real estate, um, all that stuff. It's just natural that it will live on a blockchain. So that's the other part that I'm really excited about. Um, of course, I am a data person and analytics person. So, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff around data and analytics. And I think if I would highlight one thing related to analytics and data, it's probably more applications of AI and machine learning on crypto data. And so I, I don't mean things like, oh, let's, let's run like neural networks on a blockchain. That's just a, a, a dumb idea. Um, I mean, actually just using on-chain data like what we have to make inferences and make products on top of that data. Uh, so one project that Evgeny and I worked on back in, I think it was 2000, early 2019, it was more like a pet project, but it's an example of what you can do with machine learning. Uh, we, we basically took on-chain data and created a um, token recommender based on what addresses hold. And so it's the same principle as if you go on Amazon and Amazon looks at the baskets or purchase history of all their customers. And then they train models on them to say, hey, if you like this, then you might like this as well, right? This other item or people who bought this often um, uh, bought this one as well. And it's the same principle, but we just run it on on-chain data. And it, you could say that the application itself is kind of silly. You know, you probably don't want to be making like investment advice based on just what other people hold. Um, but there's there are so many low hanging fruits on using machine learning on crypto data and on chain data. So that's one thing where we've just scratched the surface as a company. We have a lot of the competency in house. Like my my own background is AI, so you know obviously I see a lot of applications for machine learning on our data, but We've been building the foundations, and this is going to be, I think, really interesting if you're a data scientist or machine learning engineer to be working with crypto data over the next few years, because there's so many things you can do. And um, frankly, there's been very little work done in that area. Oh, very nice. Um, so um, that's great. So the last question is, this is a, 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 one of the important ones, is have you... What do you, from your vantage point, wherever you're sitting and whatever you are looking at, what do you see India and crypto as? Sorry, can you repeat that? India, because you have a lot of large right. following yeah. in India, yeah. India and crypto. Yeah. So what, have you interacted? Do you, what do you see? What do you know? Anything? So um, I have to say my main interaction with the Indian crypto ecosystem has been through Polygon. Uh, and I think Polygon, you know, they have a lot of team members that are Indian or, and are presumably based in India. I actually don't know. Yes. I didn't know yes. there's been a lot of discussion about that. But uh, and that's been amazing. Like I, th I think those guys are incredible ambassadors and probably raising awareness within India and also making sure that India is well represented among the, the big crypto companies and crypto projects, I should say, that are pushing the space forward. So that's been my main interaction. Uh, of course, we also have uh, a lot of Indian team members. Um, I think about half of them live in India and some live abroad in other places like Hong Kong. Um, but you know, those, those guys are, I kind of, as with all our team members, it's kind of like a global mindset. So there's no specific, I think, um, sort of bias or shift based on what nationality people have uh, mm -hmm. in our team. Um, but I, I'm super excited about, you know, all the great stuff that the COVID relief fund, for example, which, you know, uh, one of the Polygon co-founders spearheaded, uh, that's, that's been amazing. And I think they, they seem to be really good ambassadors. I've also interacted with a few, um, you know, a few other co-founders at earlier stage projects. Um, and 
I might be doing some angel investments into some of those projects. Uh, so I hope to be backing some of those uh, co-founders. Clearly, there's a lot of talent uh, in India, and I think you know there's also a lot of the that, that's just broader in the tech industry as a whole, right? Like a lot of the executives now uh, are Indian-born and so on. So um, yeah, I think I think actually crypto and DeFi is like a really interesting sector for India to double down on. I hope the regulatory environment, uh, you know, it stays or rather uh, shifts to be more um, positive looking at crypto. I'm not an expert on that field, but my understanding is that there's been some risks there or some some issues. Um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's great. There's a lot of talent, um, some great examples of teams like Polygon, and hopefully India will be one of the many countries that are contributing to the future of finance. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that, that helps you. Um, and that also helps in saying that you have significant number or a lot of uh, Indian uh, team members. Yeah. So, so great people, awesome. yeah. Yeah, and people should should consider it to be a career. The, there's a lot going on in the crypto space. So if you want to get involved, uh, yes. apart from investing, trading, you should get involved uh, or building new projects you can get involved in as a as a, as a team member of uh, many projects who are looking to hire global teams so yeah definitely definitely go to nonsense.ai and we have a link to a career section and uh, we have a lot of open positions we're going to be hiring pretty aggressively over the next few months and hopefully years um i would just also add to that that you know um some people think that you could kind of like go ahead and just co-found a company right away. And some people can, but I do think that there's a lot of value in getting experience, you know, working with people who have a bit more tenure. And, you know, if you're looking to learn how to work with on-chain data, frankly, there's no better place to work than Nansen. And if you want to understand, not just that, but if you want to have um, an ecosystem around you where people are, you know, actively researching crypto, uh, we are connecting with like literally the biggest funds in the space. I mean, you asked me earlier, like, what are some of the customers using Nansen? And, uh, you know, the, the biggest names like Pantera, Polychain, obviously A16Z, these are all like customers that have given us permission to mention their names. Uh, yeah. But you can imagine there's a lot more that we have not asked for that permission. Um, you know, that's, that's a really good environment for people to get started. And then that's a platform. If you want to go ahead and found your own company a few years later, that's amazing. Um, but I do think that for young people who might not have that much experience, it's a good idea to try to get a couple of years uh, working with uh, an established company or a project because you get the network and you get the experience and that will be very valuable for you later in your career. Totally. Yeah, I get it. So thanks for that. Uh, there was a lot of insights there that, that helped. Um, Means we, I think we discussed right from what the industry is to where it is going, and a lot of good thoughts. and And I think the you had a great time. I, I I learned a lot. I enjoyed having a conversation. So uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for enlightening our viewers. Thanks for uh, taking the time. It was it was a very very good session. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Alex.